page 1121 of the church Bibles, and we're going to start at verse 8. This letter's from Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, but it's Paul that's writing. And he says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and God, to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. To live lives worthy of God. And we might wonder as we look around our city how it's possible to live a life worthy of God. Andrew reminded us at the beginning of the service how wet and cold it is and just how that tends to sometimes bring out things that aren't the best in people, you know. As you, as you go around town when it's wet and it's cold, people get a little bit more irritable, they get a little bit more rude and sometimes it feels like this is like a general trend or maybe it's just something that's been going on in winter that people are a little bit more rude, a little bit more demanding, a little bit more pushy, they want a little bit more of their own space on the tube or on the DLR. Me included, you know, I'm scooping myself up in this. But I was on the tube even this afternoon and, and just looking at one of the posters there, which is, you know, telling us not to assault the staff. <laughs> I was at my GP a couple of weeks ago and there's a poster there telling us not to assault the NHS staff and the nurses. And you do wonder, you know, what kind of a place are we living in where we need posters to tell us not to physically attack um, the people who are trying to serve us, however unhelpful they may sometimes be, you know. But we can feel a bit lost in all this, can't we? It can be difficult to know how we can make a difference how we can be something different, how we can respond differently, how we can not just get caught up in all this, how we can break down some of the barriers that are between us and our neighbours. You know, they're barriers, the invisible walls, not necessarily of, of um, hate or of prejudice, but just the, the low-level irritability, the low-level not talking to people, the low-level ignoring people, turning away thinking that we have nothing to offer and nothing to share. And what do we do? We just retreat into our little comfortable places, don't we? And we play on our Xbox and we watch TV and we eat junk and that's about it. <laughs> Is there a way to break this pattern? Is there a way out of this cycle of big city selfishness? Well, Paul tells us that there is. He tells us that there is a way that we can live lives worthy of God. We can live lives worthy of God because God has got a plan to deal with all of this. God has got a plan to move us from rudeness to generosity. God has got a plan to move us from hostility to friendship. God has got a plan to move us from ignoring each other to enjoying each other. And God's plan is called church. It's always been called church. In the Old Testament, it's kahal. In the New Testament, it's ecclesia. And they both mean church, the assembly of God, the congregation of God, the people of God. And it's God's plan to deal with all the brokenness in our relationships. It's the place where God is going to fix everything and sort it out. And the way that we get into church is by following Jesus. It's the only way that we get into God's plan is by following Jesus. It's the only way that we get into God's plan is by becoming a disciple of Jesus. And Paul describes what it's like when followers of Jesus get together. Paul describes what it's like when he goes to visit other Christians in the church in Thessalonica. It's there in verse 8. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We were delighted to share. Delighted to share because sharing is what disciples are all about. 
Delighted to share because sharing is what the people of God are all about. Delighted to share because that's what church is all about. And the people of God delight to share because God delights to share. God delights to share. God the Father sent his Son into the earth, an act of generous sharing. God the Son left behind the glory that was his in heaven, came onto the earth, poured himself out in an act of generous sharing. And while he was on the earth, he called on the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shared himself with Jesus. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus achieved amazing stuff because the Holy Spirit loves to share himself. So we worship a God who loves to share God is delighted to share. It's what God is all about. Delighted to share is what Paul is all about. Delighted to share is what the church is all about. It's what we are all about. Delighted to share. But when I say that word share, I know that some of us are maybe getting a little bit anxious. For some of us, there's a a little voice going off in our head saying, but I don't want to share anything. There's a little voice going off in our head saying, I haven't got anything to share. There's maybe a little voice going off in our head saying, I haven't got anything worth sharing. My talents aren't worth sharing. My skills aren't worth sharing. My life's not worth sharing. I don't have anything to share. And I want to tell you tonight that that's not true. It's a lie. It's a lie. And it's not the truth about who you are and the truth about who you are, the truth that God wants to speak into our lives tonight is that when we choose to follow Jesus, when we choose to follow Jesus, we become by nature, by nature, people who delight to share. When we choose to follow Jesus, we become by nature people who love to give stuff away. When we become a disciple of Jesus... We become in our essence, in our core, in our very being, people who love to share. I think this is why Jesus says what he does in John chapter 7, verse 38. He says, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in me out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So when we choose to follow Jesus, we become by nature someone who shares, someone who has rivers of living water flowing out of them to give away. It's no wonder that Paul says he's delighted to share, that he's eager to share, that he's keen to share, that he loves to share. He's got these rivers of living water welling up inside him that he longs to share. So don't believe, don't believe that you've got nothing to share. It's who we are when we decide to follow Jesus. It's who we are when we decide to follow Jesus. And scripture tells us that we have some pretty amazing things to share. We have some pretty wonderful things to share. We get to share Christ with other people, Romans chapter 8. We get to share the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We get to share the Word of God with other people, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We get to share spiritual gifts with other people, 1 Peter chapter 4. We have amazing stuff to share as the disciples of Jesus. We become, by nature, when we start to follow Jesus, people who delight to share. It becomes who we are. So Paul says, we were delighted to share with you the gospel of God. We were delighted to share with you the gospel of God. So the first thing that Paul talks about sharing is the gospel. And he says that he was delighted to share the gospel. And I've been doing some thinking over the past like few months, I think, wondering what it is that stops me from sharing the gospel more often. Something that Paul describes as a delight, for some reason for me, is a little bit stressful. It can become a little bit intense. It can promote all sorts of anxiety. But Paul says he's delighted to share the gospel. And I figure he must be doing something very different to what I'm doing. 
And I think what's happened is that I've got confused. I've got confused between good news. That's what gospel means, good news. I've got confused between good news and good advice. Because good news is just telling someone about something that's happened. And good advice is telling people what they ought to do. Good news is telling people what's happened. And good news is telling people what to do. And all of the other world religions are full of good advice. They tell people what to do. They tell people what to do to please God. They tell people what to do to get to know God. They tell people what to do to get close to God. And that's not Christianity at all, but sometimes that's how I speak, as if I'm expecting people to do something. And so I get really stressed out and I get really intense and, you know, my head starts to go to, you know, doing technical drawings on the back of a napkin about different ways to live. If you can do all of that, that's fantastic. But if you can't, you might just want to think about what good news is. Good news is something that has happened. It's something that has happened. We have been rescued. We have been rescued. Or we've been saved is another way to say it. We've been rescued. And the other thing I forget when I'm thinking about good news is I forget to say who's involved. You know, I start to think as if I've got a set of propositions that I've got to start telling people about. And not that I'm telling them news about some people that they might actually be interested in. Because good news has always got people involved in it. So this news, the good news, God's good news that Paul is talking about, it's God who did the rescuing. And it's us who got rescued. God who did the rescuing and us who got rescued. So God did the rescuing. The Father, God the Father, chose us in eternity past to be his people. God the Son died in our place for our sins and our wrongdoings and took the punishment that we deserve. God the Holy Spirit worked a miracle in our hearts so that when we heard the offer of God's rescue, we said yes and we accepted it. God rescued us. God rescued us. That's good news. It's not long. It's not complicated. I know that's not the whole gospel. I know there's lots more you could say. But, you know, that's a start, isn't it? God rescued us. God rescued us. And maybe you're thinking, well, how do I drop that into conversation? How do I start talking about that? Well, the best way I've found is to say something about myself. Because I'm involved in this. I'm the person that got rescued. God rescued me. So I might say something like, I used to be obsessed about money and about how much I earned. I used to worship money. And now God's rescued me. God's rescued me. And I worship God. He's rescued me from my love of money. And this is what my life looks like now. I could say that I used to be dependent on what other people thought, on other people's opinions, on other people's views. And God rescued me. He rescued me from the idol of people-pleasing. I could say that I used to be afraid of God's anger and God's judgment and other people's anger and judgment as well about specific things that I might have done in the past. And God rescued me and now I know that I won't face God's anger even if I deserve it. This is good news. This is good news. It's good news about what God's done and it's good news about what it means for me and it's good news about what it means for us. And no wonder that Paul says that that is a delight to talk about. That is a delight to talk about. It's amazing that we get to talk about our own lives and have God show up as a major player just as we're telling the story. It's good news. And the other thing is that we never run out of good news to tell. We never run out of gospel news to tell because, you know, God doesn't just rescue us once, although he does rescue us in a big way once, but he keeps on rescuing us. He keeps on rescuing me from sin. He keeps on rescuing me from judgment. He keeps on rescuing me from the mess that I tend to make of my life uh, when I just follow my own stuff. So we always have a fresh story to tell people which points back to the gospel. God rescued me, whether that was 10 years ago, whether that was 
one year ago, whether that was last week, whether that was this afternoon, God rescued me. And we can share that story. We can share that story with people who aren't Christians, and we need to share that story as well with people who are Christians. Because Paul here is writing to the church in Thessalonica. He's, he's writing to them saying, I delighted to share the gospel with you. Well, these guys had heard the gospel before. But we keep telling each other the gospel, the good news about what God has done for us. We also start to share our lives. So Paul says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And Paul isn't talking about, you know, dividing up his life and, you know, keeping this whole bit here for himself and then just this, this little bit over here that he's going to share with the church, maybe like, you know, half an hour on a Sunday. He's not doing that. He's talking about his whole life. He's talking about his soul. He's talking about everything. And we see here what the result of that sharing is. It's the way that he talks about the other people in the church in Thessalonica. He talks about the relations that he has with those people in these intimate family terms. So verse 9, he talks about brothers and sisters. Verse 11, he talks about himself as a father and the church as his children. Verse 7, he even talks about himself as a mother to them. These are intimate family relationships which come about as Paul starts to share his life with other people in the church, as the other guys start to share their lives with each other in church. So what does this sharing of their lives actually look like? Well, I think it looks a lot like Jesus. I think it looks a lot like Jesus. Jesus shared his life with his disciples. He ate with his disciples. He drank wine with his disciples. He talked with his disciples. He walked along the road with his disciples. He went fishing with his disciples. He helped his disciples work and play whatever they were doing. He was with his disciples. He went to weddings with his disciples. He went to funerals with his disciples. Whatever he was doing, he did it with his disciples. He shared his life. He shared his life. And eight years ago, just as we were setting up uh, SPS, just as we were planting here, uh, I was living just down the road in a one-bedroom flat. It was a very nice one-bedroom flat in a gated community. There was a swimming pool and a gym and a jacuzzi in the basement, and it was all fantastic, and I loved it. And I really felt that God was calling me to move out of there, to buy a bigger place, and to share my house with guys from church. And I was horrified. <laughs> I was horrified. This was not what I had in mind at all. But I have to say, this has been the biggest blessing in my life over the last eight years, is the, the people that I've got to share my life with at the moment. Leon and Nathan are sharing that house across the road with me, and they are a huge blessing. They are amazing guys to share your life with. They're fantastic to live with. It's really easy to share the things that you enjoy. It's really easy to share the things that you enjoy. So there's nothing that I love more than a full English breakfast. There's nothing that I love more than a full English breakfast. And so at least once a week, I share a full English breakfast with some guys from church, at least once a week. And we get to open the Bible and we get to pray together. We get to share the gospel a bit. It's easy to share the things that you enjoy. I love Battlestar Galactica, TV series. So I watch it with other people. And sometimes we pray before, and sometimes we chat after about, you know, what it's got to say about God. But it's easy to share. Maybe not with some of you. I like playing Risk. You know, Risk is a game of world domination, which blokes seem to like. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's great to invite people to play that and to eat ribs and to drink beer and we might just remember how Jesus is Lord of the earth uh, and how he's rescuing us. I love working out at the gym. Sometimes I try and invite people to do that with me. I've been trying to invite Rod so that I can share the gospel with him, he can share the gospel with me. 
but somehow he's a little bit reticent to pump iron with me. I don't know why, but it doesn't have to work every time. It's the invitation that matters, you know, inviting other people into our lives because sharing the gospel and sharing our lives go together. Sharing the gospel and sharing our lives go together. They're at the heart of discipleship. They're at the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. They're at the heart of what it means to be a disciple who makes disciples. So it's easy to do. It's easy to start. Whatever you're doing, invite other people to do it with you. Whatever you're doing, invite other people to do it with you. If you're watching telly, invite other people to watch telly with you. If you're eating, invite other people to eat with you. If you're going down the pub, invite other people to go with you. I'm going down the pub after. You're welcome to join me. If you, want to, if you haven't got a lot of people that you can invite to stuff, join a connect group and there will be, you know, there'll be lots of people there that you can invite to do stuff in your life. And it doesn't just have to be you know, the entertainment and the good stuff. You know, if you've got DIY needs doing in your house, invite someone to do it with you. If you're going shopping, invite someone to do it with you. Share your life. Invite people in. Invite people to join you. Share your life. Start small in that way. Share your life. And as we share the good news, and as we share our lives, Paul says we get to share the love as well. We get to share the love as well. When we say yes to Jesus, we become sharers by nature. That's who we are, sharers. People who give stuff away and share. That's the way that Jesus makes us new. And you guys here, you're an amazing bunch of guys and you have so much to share. You have so much to offer each other. You have so much to bless each other with and to bless other people with outside this church. And we share most easily. We share most easily with people that we love. We share most easily with people that we love. And Paul says, because we loved you so much, because we loved you so much, but the Greek more exactly is because we came to love you so much. We came to love you so much. So Paul didn't land in Thessalonica and think these are all a great bunch of guys. Sure, there were some who were great, some who were good to hang out with, some who were really encouraging, some who were really positive, some who he had the same interests as, some who he could get on with really well. But we know as well that there were some people there who were more difficult. We know that his time in Thessalonica had some challenges, that there were some people who were opposed to him, some people who were angry with him, some people who were rude to him, some people who didn't want to hear him, some people who didn't want to be with him, but Paul found that as he shared the gospel and as he shared his life, that he found that inside him, he came to love people that he hadn't expected to love, and they came to love him back. He found that as he shared the gospel and shared his life, that what Jesus said about rivers of living water springing up inside him to share, that that was happening. That was happening as he started to share the gospel and to share his life. Because Jesus said, John chapter 13, Verse 35, this is how people will know that you're my disciples. This is how people will know that you're my disciples, by the love you have for one another. This is how people will know. They'll look at you and they'll see the love you have for one another. And practical love is a shared life. Practical love is a shared life. You know, it would be really odd, wouldn't it, if a couple said that they really loved each other, but they didn't spend any time with each other, or maybe once a week on a Sunday. Would we think that was love? No. It would be really odd, wouldn't it, if a couple said they loved each other, and one of them had some really good news and didn't tell the other one. We wouldn't think that was love. Practical love is sharing good news. It's sharing our lives. It's celebrating together. It's delighting in each other. 
And Jesus says, this is how people will know that you're my disciples. By the love you have for one another. They'll see us sharing our lives. They'll see us sharing good news with each other. They'll see us sharing good news with them and sharing our lives with them. And this is how, this is how I think we can make a difference or begin to make a difference in our city, in Shadwell. This is how we can come against the brokenness of relationships that we experience as we walk around the streets and travel on the tube and travel on the DLR. This is how we can come against spiritually some of the rudeness, some of the selfishness, some of the irritability, some of the brokenness. We can delight at sharing good news. We can delight at sharing our lives. We can delight in sharing our love for one another so people can look at us and see what God's love looks like in action. What God's love looks like in action. People can look at us and see a different way to live. A different way to live. A life full of love and full of sharing and full of delight. They can look at us and see what a life worthy of God is all about. A life worthy of God, sharing good news, sharing life, and sharing our love for each other.